Hello and welcome to Vegetarians and Meat Lovers with Table Recipes. I am your host, Julie Hogue, and on my podcast, I talk about things related to how to cook for people of multiple diets, like people who are vegetarians and people who love to eat meat. How do you mesh those two diets into one meal without making yourself into a short order cook? This is currently my Christmas series where I'm talking about all kinds of recipes for Christmas and for the holiday season. I've done Christmas quiche recipes, mulled wine. Check them out. They're all listed there. And this one is about Christmas cookies and an appetizer, which is a hybrid appetizer with meat and vegetarian portions so that you can feed your people, whoever are making cookies with you. So imagine you're making this day of cookie baking, right? And you're having some friends over or some family or just your own family from your home, and you've been focusing on the cookies. You forgot to get something for everyone to munch on while making cookies. I have a recipe that I created. I created out of necessity. We were throwing a party, and I had forgotten to buy some things for a particular recipe, and I I needed another recipe dish to put out. And so I came up with this recipe last minute. So so that's why in my cookbook, One Dish, Two Diets, which is actually free right now, an ebook on Amazon. Today's the last day, so get it. I'll put the link down in the podcast notes. The last minute hybrid pickle wrap appetizer. It's something that you probably already have all the ingredients for in your fridge. They're very common ingredients that people use every day. So it's something that you could make this last minute and put it out. And then I'm also going to talk about cutout cookie recipe, peanut blossoms, and pula bread, which is a Finnish recipe that has been around for a very long time. Uh, My family history is Finnish. My dad was 100% Finnish, and his parents actually were born in Finland. So this recipe is actually from a different cookbook, but I'm including it in this recipe podcast because it's so good. It's a wonderful Christmas bread to have. So that will, those are the recipes that are going to be in this episode. I'll put as many of them as I can down in the podcast notes, but since I'm doing several this time, they may not all fit. So I'll put a link to the hybrid pickle wrap appetizer onto my website. So you can click through there if you want to see that recipe. It's pretty easy. You might even be able to remember this one without having to look it up. But I also put it on Pinterest. So it's done pretty well on Pinterest. It's a little bite-sized appetizer. It looks like a little roll. It's actually pretty attractive looking. It looks nice. It looks like it was complicated to make perhaps, but it's like so super easy. How do you do it? What do you need? Okay, you're going to need some baby dill pickles. And the amount depends on the pickle size, right? Because baby dill pickles are not consistent across brands or even the same brand often. When I did it, I used 16 baby dill pickles, one eight-ounce package of cream cheese softened, five thin slices of ham sandwich meat. Of course, you could use other sandwich meat if you don't happen to have ham. You could do turkey, roast beef, I don't know, whatever, chicken. And 10 deli sliced thin pieces of cheddar cheese. It's better to have those because they're so like thin and big, like a big square, right? And they'll cover a lot of the tortilla without making it really thick cheese. You could try slicing it really thin, although that'd be a little bit more time intensive. But if you happen to have these in your fridge for making sandwiches, they're perfect for making this little appetizer. And then you're going to use four burrito-sized flour tortillas. Now you're going to make some vegetarian and some meat ones if you're going for the hybrid plan or the last-minute hybrid pickle wrap appetizer. It's a great solution you're running low on food, you're having a party and you want to make these quick, instead of running to the store in the middle of your party, you could just make these. I mean, they're pretty easy and quick and people tend to really like them. Okay, so what are you going to do? You're going to lay out the tortilla on a flat cutting board. You're going to spread two tablespoons of cream cheese over the entire surface of the tortilla. And then you're going to lay two and a half slices of cheddar cheese in a line down the middle of that tortilla. For ham rolls, Lay two and a half slices of ham or other meat on top of those cheese slices. And since you're going to use four tortillas, what I've often done, depending on how many people are going to want meatless, I do two burritos of meatless and two with meat, like half and half. Obviously, you can vary that as you desire. Then you're going to spread one tablespoon of cream cheese down the middle of the ham, 
or the cheese slices. And then you're going to dry off the pickles with a paper towel to remove surface moisture. That just works better so they're not like drippy. They're not getting the tortilla wet. So I find it better to just roll them in there, blot them in a paper towel, get them drier than they are when they first come out of the pickle jar. And you're lay them down the middle of the cheese or the ham slices, like just like a line of pickle. <laughs> that sounds kind of funny, right? A line of pickle. Then you're going to roll the tortilla tightly, starting at one edge parallel to the pickle. So roll it as tightly as you can. And as you're doing this, kind of squeeze it and press as you're rolling it so you get it as tightly as possible. And you're going to keep rolling, go over the pickles and all the way to the other edge. So you make a roll. Then you're going to cut this tortilla roll into one inch sections and repeat for the remaining three tortillas. And then you can serve it immediately or put it in the fridge. It's in my cookbook, One Dish, Two Diets, and which is actually free right now in ebook. I am celebrating Christmas, so I'm doing a, a free promotion. And also to celebrate the fact that One Dish, Two Diets is now in hardcover. So it's available in hardcover, audio book, which I actually narrated myself. And with that, you actually get a copy of the ebook when you do the audio book. And it's in paperback. And of course, ebook. The ebook is the one that is free right now. So check that out. Today is the last day that it's free, December 10th, 2022. It is free until 11.59 Pacific Standard Time on Amazon. So check that out. Also, my cookbook is also available in paperback now, the American Midwest Cooking Quiches. It's available in ebook and in paperback. Okay. So you got your last minute appetizer figured out and you're getting ready to make your Christmas cookies. Do you have favorite Christmas cookies you like to make? I bet you do. Everyone does. They have such great memories in food. You ever thought about the fact that there's memories in food? That flavor, that same flavor that you taste every year, it triggers stuff in your brain. It triggers memories. It triggers feelings. And when we eat these foods at the holidays, it just brings about wonderful feelings for us. It may trigger memories of when we made these particular recipes with a family member or when, say, a mom or a grandma or a dad or grandpa used to make these recipes. It just brings it all together and makes it so strong when you're eating something and the memories flood in. What a great way to enjoy food in the holidays. Okay, so this recipe is one of the favorites of my family. And it's a common recipe. And it's the peanut blossom recipes. We got that peanut butter and chocolate flavor going together. It's so good. This recipe came from a friend of my mom's. And I'm looking at this recipe card right now. It's in my mom's handwriting. And it's just so fun because it's just fun to have the card of hers, even though it's all like brownish and it's like obviously old and it's stained. It's so fun to have recipes from a person who is important in your life. My mother is no longer alive. She died when I was a teenager. So anything I have in her handwriting is, is precious to me. And also recipes. And you know, it's just fun to think about the fact that at one point she held this recipe, right? She was making this for us when we were children. And so it's just really fun for me to have this now Use the same recipe, same recipe card for my own family. And my kids just gobble, the whole family, even my husband gobbles up these cookies. I tend to make a couple of batches of them in the holiday season because they're so popular at my house. How do you make the peanut blossoms? One and three-fourths cup flour, one teaspoon baking soda, one half teaspoon salt. You're going to mix those dry ingredients together in a separate bowl. You're going to do one half cup butter. And I usually make it a little bit melted. It doesn't have to be like hot or anything, but just melted so that you can stir and cream together the one half cup butter, one half cup peanut butter, one half cup sugar, and one half cup packed brown sugar. So cream all those together. And then you're going to add one egg and one teaspoon of vanilla. Then you're going to blend your dry and wet ingredients together in a mixing bowl for, in a mixer. So you're going to want to use a mixer for this to really mix up your dough. An electric mixer works the best here. So you're going to do that and you're going to make the dough ball. And I find it works best if you then wrap that dough ball in wax paper or parchment paper or something you know, wrap, some sort of wrap, and then put it in the fridge for a while so it gets firm. It's just easier to make the balls are not as sticky, as mushy, and 
It's just easier to work with dough that is chilled. So I stick that in the fridge, let it get hard, let it firm up a bit, and then I'll take it out and start to make the cookie balls. So you're going to make cookie balls in your palms. You're going to just do like a little teaspoon and you're going to roll the ball in your palms and you're going to roll it in a bowl of sugar. So you get it sugar coated. You could try this with Splenda. I have not done that yet. My oldest son is into low sugar, which I actually am too. So sometime I should try this with Splenda and see if it works good. I have made my banana bread recipe with Splenda and that actually worked out very, very well. I was amazed how good it turned out. So Splenda is a good option for people who want to cut sugar or still avoid sugar during the holidays. For this recipe, I generally make with full-blown sugar. Okay, so then you're going to put it on a cookie sheet and you're going to bake it And I tend to bake it at 360 degrees for about five to six minutes. And then you're going to pull it out and you're going to put the Hershey Kiss chocolates in each one. So you're going to press it down in there, press that Hershey Kiss down in the ball of the cookie. And then you're going to put it back in the oven and cook for another five minutes or so until golden brown. And these are kind of deceptive cookies. They don't really get like golden on the top. So If you're questioning whether they're done, I would suggest taking a spatula and like scooping one up a little bit and looking at the bottom because they can be overcooked. It's kind of deceptive. It looks like it might not be done. So, and also it depends on the size of your cookie ball. If you're making bigger balls, you're going to need to cook it longer. You're cooking smaller balls less. So that is a variation. And I usually seal these up in a container and everybody eats them very quickly. <laughs> they don't they don't last long around my house. They are really good though. I mean they're they're just a delicious flavor. They're a Christmas holiday favorite. I know many people have that recipe, but that's the recipe I love and it's really good. I totally recommend it. <laughs> okay, and this is another recipe I totally recommend. This is the best cookie cutout recipe I've ever tried. And it's from my aunt. My aunt is an amazing cook. I have a lot of recipes from my aunt and it's just fun to, again, use her recipes too. Okay, this is for cutout cookies and the nutmeg in this just, it's really delicious. It's a really good cookie. I've, like I said, I've tried other cutouts and my kids are just like, "Mm, no, (laughs) not as good as this one, mom. This is the best one. So you need four cups of flour one teaspoon baking powder, one half teaspoon baking soda, one half teaspoon salt, one half teaspoon nutmeg, one cup of soft butter. There's a note here that says you could use like vegetable shortening. I have never done that. I've only used butter. One and a half cups of sugar, one egg, one half cup dairy sour cream, and one teaspoon vanilla. Now, if you do not have sour cream, a good substitute for that is three ounces of cream cheese and milk to make about a one half cup. So whatever it is, the sour cream or the cream cheese, do get it to one half. I usually use the sour cream. I've never actually tried making it with the cream cheese and the milk, but my aunt has that on here as a way to make a substitution if you happen to not have any sour cream on hand. Okay, so you're going to sift the flour, stir the flour, the baking powder, soda, salt, and nutmeg together. You're going to stir that all so it's all mixed up nice and good in the dry ingredients. And then in your mixer, in your mixing bowl, you're going to have the butter, the sugar, the egg, and you're going to beat that on medium speed until it's light and fluffy. Then change your mixer to low speed and beat in the sour cream and vanilla until the mixture is smooth and mixed. Next, you're going to add your flour and beat it until it's well mixed. Using a rubber scraper, you're going to be obviously, you know, scooping down that flour that gets stuck on the sides of the bowl so you can get it all incorporated into the dough. And it's going to form a dough ball that you are, again, going to want to wrap in waxed paper or foil or parchment paper or something. Wrap it up so it stays moist and put it in the fridge for several hours. This is a thing that I do because it's so much easier to work with it when it's firm, when the dough is firm. If it's all like soft and sticky and stuff, it's really hard to roll out. So I tend to do this. And sometimes when I'm, if I'm having, you know, people over or my family is making the cookies with me, my kids, 
I'll plan ahead and I'll make this even the day before or the morning of early so that it has that time to sit there. And it's kind of nice to have the dough out of the way. So when you're doing cookie making, the dough is already done, right? So then you just have to start actually processing that dough and you're going to roll it out on a floured surface with a rolling pin. And it's important to get the consistent thickness, if you can, across the cookies so that they bake the same way on the pan. If you have some that are from a thinner dough rollout, they're going to get done quicker. And you're probably going to have to remove them before the end of the cooking time because they're going to get done, too done, before the thicker ones do. So I try to have it be consistent. Of course, when you're making cookies with other people, other people are rolling them out, that may not happen. But then maybe, you know, you could have a pan of thinly rolled out cookies and a pan of thicker rolled out cookies. And you're going to use those cookie cutters and do all those fun Christmas shapes, Santa Claus, trees, stockings, candy canes. That's one of the favorite things of my youngest son to do. He loves to pick out which cookie cutter he's going to use. And he likes to use as much of the dough as possible. Like he's an efficient cookie dough cutter outer. <laughs> he like wants to use up every little speck, you know, and if he has a little speck that has rolled out, has been used, he'll look for like a little cookie cutter and then he'll just be like, Ooh, I used all this, you know, like that brings him some sort of satisfaction. <laughs> I tend to like these a little bit thicker rather than thinner, more like cakey like or dough, doughy than soft rather than too thin and crispy. Everybody has their preferences, but that's why I tend to like this particular cookie. So you're going to Bake it in the oven at 375 degrees on lightly greased cookie sheets. I haven't always done that. Sometimes I just forget and I plop it on there and it works just fine. Instacart groceries delivered in as little as one hour. Free delivery on your first order, $35. Save yourself that trip to the market. Instacart delivers groceries in as fast as one hour. They connect you with personal shoppers in your area to shop and deliver groceries from your favorite stores. Free delivery on your very first order over $35. Following the link in the show notes, let's Instacart know we sent you and help support our show. Multiple stores available. Shop all of your favorites on a single order. The products you love from your local stores. Hand selected by shoppers based on your preferences. Delivery to your door in as fast as one hour. Instacart highlights deals to help you save money. Don't we all want that? Find everything you usually buy and get smart suggestions for new items. Instacart picks the freshest produce and keeps your eggs safe too. Woohoo! Those are things I want. Try it out today. You will love it. Typical time is 10 to 12 minutes of cooking until they are golden brown. Now, they start to get golden brown on the top. They're probably really golden brown underneath, so you really need to get them out. So I tend to try to get them out, you know, just as the tops are just either not golden yet or just about to turn or just turning golden. If you're not sure, again, just take that spatula, lift up that cookie and look underneath it. You can tell by the bottom if it's done. Sometimes easier to tell than when you're looking at the top of that cookie. So you're going to take them out and this recipe does yield quite a few cookies. If you, you know, my aunt has a note on here, six dozen. That's going to depend on your cookie cutter size, obviously. But I always lay them all out on parchment paper so they can cool so that they're ready to frost. We tend to frost them with frosting. I tend to buy frosting. So I have made frosting a few times, but you know, it's, a busy time. <laughs> so I tend to buy canned frosting. I know it might be kind of like cheating, but whatever. I'm a busy mom. I do what works. And my youngest son really likes to do the different colored frosting. So I always make sure that I have dye, which reminds me I need to go to the store today and get some dye. We have like blue and yellow, which is fine, but it's fun to have the red and green, right? Now, if this were me, and I was doing this and I realized I didn't have it. I would use Instacart. Now I'm a partner with Instacart and I'm going to put all the links down in the podcast notes where you could get stuff from Instacart that you need within an hour. That's huge. You forgot something or something went bad and you're making food. You can use Instacart to get those products to your home with very little effort. 
free delivery on gifts for the home on your first Instacart order. You can get decorations, candles, hosting essentials, food, even tech gear. I mean, you know, if you want to do a little bit of shopping, (laughs) that's a way you could get some Christmas shopping done. Or just food. If you need food, you can get that from Instacart. Uh, Down in the podcast notes will be the links to that. They have a bunch of specials going on through December 24th. So those links will be down there through then. And they have a lot of things. So check them out. Not just food. So the fun thing about these kind of cookies, these cutouts, is you can add the sprinkles. So many fun sprinkles out there. I have this really fun sprinkle that's like a big star, like it's like a candy almost. And you sprinkle it on there. So there's so many fun sprinkles. Or like, I really like those glitter sugar sprinkles. Those are really fun. They're like glittery iridescent. I've seen some white ones too, which I think are really fun. So many fun, yummy things to make on the holidays. And Those sprinkles really add so much fun and flair to the cookies. And when I'm done with these cookies, once the kids have decorated them, or I have, because they don't tend to always finish, right? I put them in a sealed Tupperware container. And since they have all that frosting, I usually do layers of the parchment paper or wax paper in between the layers just to keep them nice. And so frosting doesn't get on the bottoms of other cookies it just makes it easy. And then I leave mine on the counter and my kids just devour them. Like they just go through them so fast. It's so much fun though. I love doing these recipes that are traditions. And so I highly recommend this one if you're looking for a new cutout recipe. It's really, really good. Now this last recipe that I'm going to talk about is a traditional Finnish recipe. My heritage on my dad's side is Finnish. My dad was 100% Finnish, and his parents were actually born in Finland. And so I have a lot of that Finnish flavor growing up from my dad wanting these particular recipes, and my mom would generally make them because she was the cook of the house, and he really liked these Finnish recipes. This is a Pula yeast coffee bread recipe, and this one is something that my aunt gave me because I wanted... Uh, the coffee bread recipe, the pool of coffee bread recipe, and I couldn't find my mom's. And my aunt said, this is the one that she's always used and the one that she had given my mom too. It's from the Finnish cookbook by Beatrice A. Ojakangas, which makes me laugh because my maiden name, my maiden last name is actually Kangas. So it's kind of funny, Ojakangas. So find her cookbook if you want more Finnish recipes. Again, it's the Finnish cookbook. And if I can find that link on on Amazon. I'll put it down in the podcast notes so that you could easily find it if you want to check out these Finnish recipes of hers. I wanted to share this one because it's such a fun part of my Christmas holiday celebration. My kids love this recipe. My nephew will like like eat almost a whole loaf if you let him. (laughs) It's so good. It really is. It's really good with coffee. And I won't lie, this is a bear of a recipe, but it's so worth it. But it is a lot of work. So you have to plan a big chunk of time. Don't try to squeeze this in a little chunk of time. This is a, if you have the day off, a weekend recipe, because it is so long involved and it has a lot of steps. So I'm going to read this to you and you've got to try it though. It's so good. It's so worth it. It's yummy. What do you need? You need one package of active dry yeast, one half cup warm water, two cups of milk. You're going to scald that. So it's scalded and then you need to cool it to lukewarm. I generally will scald it and then put it in the fridge to cool down quicker. Then one cup or even less of sugar, one teaspoon salt, one teaspoon cardamom, cardamom, it's hard to say, four eggs beaten, eight to nine cups of white flour, one half cup melted butter. And then I tend to use cream cheese frosting on this bread. You could do whatever you want. You can even not use frosting, which I'll get to in the end, which is is a good way to have it too. My dad always loved this with the cream cheese frosting and then sliced maraschino cherries on top. That's hard to say. Okay. So how do you do this? Okay, so you're going to take your yeast and you're going to dissolve it in the warm water and you're going to stir in the milk, which is cooled because you don't want to like, you know, kill off the yeast right away because your your milk is still hot. 
So stir in the milk, the sugar, salt, cardamom, eggs, and enough flour to make a batter, which is generally around two cups of flour. Beat until the dough is smooth and elastic. Now that sounds weird, but it actually is true. You'll know what I mean when you're making it. Dough is an interesting thing to work with. It has these stages and you have to do these things. And you can tell when a dough ball is ready, if you've worked with dough at all in your life, you can tell. You can tell when it's like at the right stage and you have to like mix it or beat it until it's at the right spot. So beat that dough after the two cups of flour until it's smooth and elastic, and then add about three cups of the flour and beat well. The dough should be quite smooth and glossy at this point. Then you're going to add the melted butter and stir well. Beat again until the dough looks glossy and stir in the remaining flour and you're going to get a stiff dough ball. So keep keep stirring it. I like to use my KitchenAid with the dough hook. That works quite well for kneading this. So you're going to get your stiff dough ball and then you're going to turn that out on a floured board and cover it with a bowl and let it sit there and rest for 15 minutes. Dough has to rest. Then you're going to knead it until it's smooth and satiny. And at this point, you're using your hands. So you're going to want floured fingers, floured palms, just flour your hands. So kneading it until it's smooth and satiny. And then you're going to place it in a mixing bowl that is greased. I usually use olive oil and just kind of coat all the sides of the bowl. And you're going to turn that dough ball over so that it gets greased on all sides. You're going to cover it lightly and let it rise in a warm place until it's doubled in bulk, which takes about an hour. Then you get to punch it. (laughs) I'm serious. You get to punch it. Punch it down. You're just going to literally beat it. Beat it down. It's, you know, it was puffy. You're beating it down. And then you're going to let it rise again. Cover it and let it rise again until it's almost doubled in size, which is about 30 minutes. Then you're going to turn it out onto a slightly floured board, and you're going to divide this dough ball into three parts. And then each of those three parts, you're going to divide into three, because this is what you're going to braid. You're going to braid this bread. So I do them one at a time. So I have three dough balls. I'll take the first one, and you're going to divide that into three amounts of dough, three dough balls. And you want to make them as consistent in size as possible because as this bread cooks, since it's braided, each strand like kind of cooks on its own. So if you have one that's like way too thick and one that's way too thin, you're not going to get consistent cooking across your bread dough. And you may have some parts that are overdone and other parts that are less done or doughy. So it's important to get these dough balls to about the same size as close as possible. And then you're going to roll them out into long strips, about 12 to 15 inches, as the recipe says, but I have never gotten them to 15 inches. That seems difficult to me. (laughs) I've gotten them to like 10 to 12. Maybe I'm not working with them long enough, but so you're going to make these strands and then you're going to braid them. So again, you want them to be as consistent in size as possible. The strands to be consistent along the way, wholly down the strand of the dough. Then you're going to pinch it at the top and kind of fold it under. I've forgotten to do this sometimes. And then in the end, the loaf will start to, like the strands will start to pop apart. So you want to squeeze them together. And then you're going to braid it and then do the same at the end of the dough. When you're done with the braid, squeeze those strands together and tuck it under two because you're going to want it to stay intact as a dough braid. I do that with the other two balls of dough as well. And the best way to do this too, I would say, is between your palms and the board, just kind of roll the dough so that it becomes this long strand of dough. And you just keep rolling your hands. My dad remembers his mom doing this when he was a child. It's a fond memory. He used to talk about it. He used to remember watching his mom rolling out this dough at Christmas time. So it's a fun little memory that he always used to talk about. So after they're braided and pinched on the ends, then you're going to move it to a lightly greased baking sheet and you're going to let it rise as a braid for about 20 minutes. And the braids should be puffy, but they don't necessarily double in size this time. One thing you can do if you don't want to use the frosting is to glaze the loaves with beaten egg and you could sprinkle it with crushed sugar or um, anything you want, sprinkles or something. And you could add almonds or walnuts or some sort of nuts to it if you like. Otherwise, I like to do the frosting because that's what everybody seems to like. I do the cream cheese frosting. And I have made it before, but again, I've also bought it. So do whatever works for you. And then you're going to bake it 
at 375 degrees. Now, the actual recipe says 400, but when I do that in my oven, I find that dough strands can be doughy in the center. So I tend to not use 400 degrees. I like 375. And maybe, again, this is a difference of how thin you're getting those strands. Maybe this works best in her recipe at 400 degrees if you have those long 12 to 15 inch dough strands. For me, I guess mine end up being a little bit shorter. So I like 375 and I cook it for 15 to 18 minutes. In the recipe, if you do have, she has 20, 25 to 30 minutes at 400 degrees. And I have not found that that was what worked for me and how I make them. I like it at 375 degrees at 15 to 18 minutes. And you really have to watch these loaves. So when they're getting close to being done, don't, it's not time to go to the bathroom. It's not time to go do laundry or anything like that. Stay close because they can get too dry if they get overbaked. And it could be doughy in the center if they're underbaked. And they start to get golden on the top. And when they're getting golden on the top, they generally are definitely golden on the bottom and you need to get them out. So you need to watch them. If you're worried about them, again, check the bottom as they're cooking to see if they are getting close to being done. They are a gorgeous bread loaf. It's a braided one that it just really looks attractive. And the nice part about doing the the egg and the sugar is you get to see that braided more that braid an effect more on the bread. If you slap all this frosting on there, you don't see it as much, but it still looks really pretty and nice, even with the white frosting covering up the braid. But it's so good with the frosting. <laughs> we just love it at our house and in my family. So I continue to do the frosting. And you're going to bake them to a light golden brown again. And you're going to take them out and let them cool. I let them cool before I'm going to frost them so that the frosting doesn't drip down and just like get liquefied, right? And then you slice it and eat it. It's so good with coffee, even hot chocolate, even as a dessert at your dessert table on the holidays. Christmas morning, it's great. Really good, good coffee bread. Pula yeast coffee bread, it's called. And again, it's from the Finnish cookbook by Beatrice A. Ocha Kangas. Give her her total credit because this is her recipe. And other thing I want to say, I have a note at the bottom of my little recipe here. Cook longer if you have thicker loaves. So if you have shorter, thicker loaves, you can do that. And I have tried cooking this on convection oven, and I did not like how it turned out. I felt like it was doughy in the center. So I do just regular oven for it. Try it out. Whatever works for you, it may work for you. I didn't have, felt like I didn't have good success with that. Anyway, it's delicious. I hope you try it out. I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode talking all about Christmas cooking and an appetizer that works for vegetarians and meat eaters, something quick and easy that you can make. And again, don't forget to check out the Instacart deals and try them out if you ever need something last minute. Within an hour, they're your company. Just a great resource if you're ever in a pickle. In a pickle. And I talked about pickle appetizers earlier, right? <laughs> if you're ever in a pickle and need something, try that. Or just if you, if you don't want to go to the store, you're tired of shopping, you've been Christmas shopping, holiday shopping, you don't want to go to the store again, try them out. It's a great convenient way to get what you need for your home. And it's not just food. They have other products and gifts too. You could shop right from your own home without even going anywhere. How nice is that? A great option. Links down in the podcast notes. Also, the link to my One Dish, Two Diets cookbook, which is free. Today is the last day. So again, click through and get that ebook if you'd like. And I would love to hear your thoughts in a review if you are able to do that. That would be fantastic. And happy holidays, happy shopping, happy holiday eating. I hope you're enjoying it and I hope you have an amazing day. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Have a good one.